picture that studio zone. Arizona UFC, Bellator, BYB. We are talking about it live with the GOAT, Mike Goldberg, on the MMA Ho! I needed to learn how to do some of that stuff. <laughs> Let's just get right into it. I, I mean, seriously, how did like you graze? You got the, the guns going. I, Man, I'll tell you what. It's outstanding. <laughs> and you just gave birth again three months ago, Chris. Like, I mean, you're amazing. No this need. is the luckiest woman ever. <laughs> No need to go into the introduction, right? We know what's going on here, Mike. Thanks well, for... I, I, I'm caught up on you guys. I'm caught up on you guys. And I, I do have to say one thing, which I thought was awesome and a great compliment to your better half, is when I joined you in the studio and we called those fights together, there were a lot of people like kind of saying, Goldie, shut the F up and let Jess do play by play. And I'm like, oh, did I be hurt here? Like, this is in my thing, but I got reptile skin at this point in my career. I get beat up so much, but let Jess know that. I mean, I was getting booted off the microphone quickly. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. Like, I, that's my fault because we should have said, hey, man, we do like radio style commentary. Right. And right. then, like, we dragged you into the fire. <laughs> And the chat yeah. was like, what the fuck, bro? Yeah, I tell you what, if you ever decide to come back into that shit show, um, <laughs> put the notes aside and just let's tell them what the fuck's going on. Because it's funny, that man. I, I was so weirded out because you got, you have been calling UFC fights forever. You're the voice of the octagon. And here my dysfunctional chat is yelling at you like, shut up, Goldie. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I can. You know, and. When I was in Sarasota, Florida, Chris, with my first job out of college, we were included, our channel in Sarasota was included with the big three stations in Tampa. And so there was like a poll of best and worst sportscaster, newscaster, weather, this and that. And I won best and worst. <laughs> and I, I remember talking to my boss, Linda Demeray, may she rest in peace, and she said, that is the greatest thing that could happen. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what all this, like, you're no good. You're the worst. You're the worst. They know your name. They have an opinion. And so that's a good thing. And I said, all right. So, but we're going to go with the best first, right, boss? <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alphabetically, we can do best over worst. But I won both categories. So maybe that's what was happening when I was with you guys. I tell you what, I think the fact that you have such a thick skin and you could roll with the punches is what makes you so likable. You know, Thank like you. I, your career has been so long just because, I mean, you're just a good guy at the end of the day. You know, I, I, I do my best. It's how I was raised. Uh, you and I talked about it when uh, when I was in the studio in your palatial studio <laughs> in suburban Phoenix. Um, I, I'm a hockey player. I grew up, you know, with the DNA of a hockey player coached by a by a man who was on the 1958 Montreal Canadian Stanley Cup championship team knows was like the Mississippi River, or in my case, I should say the, the Ohio River being a Cincinnati boy. And we'll forget about what happened last Sunday. We'll start the season this Sunday against Baltimore, but I <laughs> will move forward. Um, and I was just always taught to be a locker room guy. And, uh, and that's what I try to be. I've been very, very blessed to be able to do something that I love for the last three going on four decades. And I don't take that lightly, Chris. And because of that, I understand that being a real person is not really a chore because I really am no different than anybody else. If anything, I might be a little bit more blessed than some people only because I get to do something that I love. That doesn't mean you have to be a broadcaster or do the UFC to be doing something that you love, but I work hard, I do my prep, I have travel, I was away from my kids a lot when they were young but I never hated going to work and I still don't hate going to work. And for that, I think the big man upstairs. Yeah. I, I tell you what, man. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool to hear you talk like that. It's really, it's really nice. It's refreshing because you know, it's funny, like in this world, especially the YouTube world and, and the MMA yeah. YouTube world, it's cutthroat, man, like <laughs> shady people. And I, I'm sure you've dealt, you've had your, I having a shitty Sunday on the NFL on Fox. Oh, <laughs> I still have like bruises on my liver and kidneys, which I deserved a lot of it. I just shouldn't, I should not have pressed that button because I would have had a chance to do the game the next week. It would have been Buffalo and Minnesota and I would have gotten all the kinks out because it had been a number of years since I had called football 
And it just was one of those days and it did not go well. I'm the first to admit it. But if I would have just taken a deep breath and said, you know what, that was my mulligan. Let's go do it right next week and no looking back, it would have been okay. But I, but I got caught up in it and, and it is, it's difficult not to get caught up in it. But I've learned some tough lessons over the years, and so now I I, I kill them with kindness. It's, it's funny, like when we had you on the first time, uh, I had my family over from New York, and and they Al? were they were super excited about you coming on the show and everything like that. And um, I was talking to them, I was like, I didn't even know about the NFL thing. I had no idea. I was just a fan <laughs> of you in the UFC. So when I was doing research and I saw that knucklehead put that video out about you, I was like. Uh. If he only knew Mike Goldberg, like that's all I was thinking, you know, like yeah, if he only knew yeah. who you were as a person, he wouldn't have put that video out. And and that's the thing about how toxic social media has become. And now it's even a controlled toxic form of social media in many ways with X and all these changes. But people throw around compliments like manhole cover but they'll get that bow and arrow out and they'll shoot you right between the eyes as quickly as possible and not sit back and realize that that's another human being who has a family, who mm -hmm. has a mother and father who are both up in heaven, but who has kids, who has friends, who is working his ass off to try to entertain everybody who's watching that night to try to represent the fighters or whatever sport it might be in my best fashion possible. And they don't think that way. They think they can sit home and yell at the TV and do a better job, and maybe some of them can. And I always said, send your tape if, if that's the case. And, and not in an arrogant way, Chris, but, I mean, people want to shoot at you. People yeah. want to cut you down. And uh, I'll never forget, I was in Sarasota, that same job, and it was uh, I was doing the 6 and 11 broadcast. And at that time, Dick Vitale led, lived in Bradenton. So he was right in our viewing area. It was before his girls went up and played tennis at Notre Dame. And Dickie V would come on with me. And it was when Dickie V was prime time. I mean, it was when he was at the top of the top of the top. And I remember him saying, Goldie, as you move up that tree, the branches will get thinner and thinner and the cover will become less and less. And that was certainly the case. When you're down, just kind of doing whatever, people leave you alone. But the more you work yourself up that tree, the thinner the branches are and the more open you are for those snipers who want to just hide behind a fake name on social media and, and try to take shots at you. And then when they get personal and start bringing in my family, that's that's when it goes a little bit over the top. But, you know, it's, it's human nature. I get it. And uh, I roll on with it. I have great things to do every day in my life. Great people like yourself to talk to and to do podcasts with and, and to just talk everything with. And that's the way I look at it moving What's your thoughts about the evolution of uh, uh, like media, right? It's like now yeah. you, now it's craziness. Like people are journalists and they're kind of getting pushed aside. And you got these people on YouTube and, and Twitter and, and TikTok. They're starting these shows and with no schooling, no background, and they're becoming so popular. Like the UFC is pulling in Nelk Boys and they're pulling in this Nina drama just because they're social media influencers. And it's very smart. But what do you think about this like kind of switch going over to the world of the internet? Um, I believe that, well, first and foremost, let's go back to my early days with Zufa and the UFC. And yes, they spent a lot of money. And yes, Lorenzo and Frank, they went 50, 60 million in the hole and almost pulled the plug before the Ultimate Fighter. Anyone who's a UFC fan knows that story. But the UFC was also, I believe, the first sports promotion to maximize the eyes and ears that they could utilize and get to through social media. It's when social media was just starting to have a presence and when people were still appreciative and nice because all of a sudden they felt like you were interacting, just me and you, mm -hmm. because I'm on, I'm on a chat with you or I'm answering your tweet. And the UFC was always great at that. And then as it grew, then the big sponsors came in and then they had, they basically owned FS1 and FS2 with programming, but still the social media part of it has always been massive for the Ultimate Fighting Championship and many other great promotions. And I, I guess it, it was just a matter of time um, until people would find something or someone that they liked. Somebody mm -hmm. doesn't want to like DC for some reason. And somebody thinks Joe should have left five years ago. And these aren't my opinion at all. Somebody thinks John doesn't say this or that properly. So they find some guy on YouTube who's wife just had a second baby who calls himself an MMA hole. Wait, no, wait a second. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but no, they, they go that way, right? And yeah. 
if you can find that niche, you can not only get a lot of viewers, but you can make yourself some dollars and cents too. And it, it is a different world. I mean, just look at how Showtime just disappeared. Now everything is Paramount Plus. Yeah. Everything's, if, if you're not streaming, you're not dreaming anymore. I mean, and that's why we see the cuts in these regular TV forms. I think it's great that we have instantaneous access to so much, but I also think that, you know, too many, too many cooks can, can ruin the meal too. And so, yeah. uh, you, you can only get so many spoons in that pot and you still have a great bit of a skyline chili from Cincinnati, it, it but, seems, but it's not surprising. It's yeah. Not surprising. It seems like a lot of people are just like, "Hey, I could do that," and then everyone. I mean, I mean, it is easy to start. It's it's right. not easy to grow, you know, a platform. But I mean, it's it's a pretty wild time to be alive right now. Like, you know, if you have enough drive, you can basically do anything with the internet. It's it's very true, and and that's why I commend you and Jess for for your perseverance and your hard work. And I remember, you know, in break sitting there with you, your wife, your family. And, and talking about how you guys were still trying to trying to break even. You're still trying to yeah. get to the Mendoza. And now 80,000, 90,000 loyal, loyal subscribers and loyal viewers and, and loyal followers. Um, you and your wife are a great example of someone who is worthy of listening to, but more importantly, willing to put in the work and, and go through those down days. I mean, my first job out of college, I was making five bucks an hour. I took a pay cut from my bartending job at Chi Chi. And I had a college degree, um, it, but with you at the house, the sacrifice and the time that you guys take to do what you do to build your platform is one that I applaud. I, I applaud massively to both you guys and to people like yourselves who, who do start with nothing because you don't have a guaranteed salary. You don't have other than Joe, but Joe started from the bottom too. But there's not millions and millions of dollars being thrown around on brand new podcasts. There's a mm -hmm. lot of people starting it up, thinking they can be different, thinking they can be special and hoping to monetize it at a certain point. And so people like yourself, I applaud massively. And, and that's why you and I talked about it before. That's why a guy like Roy Jones Jr. said, and I quote, more people need to learn some things from Jake Paul. Now it may not yeah. be exactly how to box or who to box or when to box, but how to sell yourself and how to make money, Jake's pretty good at it. And he's, he's bringing other boxers with him, which I think is awesome as well. You know, it's funny. Uh, I don't know if we told you this, but like, well, first off, uh, chat, this is Mike Goldberg over here. We had the pleasure of uh, doing a couple of streams with him. And then one day he decided to be nice enough to come over and stream in my bedroom. And we <laughs> <laughs> we had an intimate moment together. It was fantastic. But I got to tell you, when you walked into that room, right, I was yeah. sweating my ass off because I was like, damn, man. I'm like, I can't believe Mike Gold Goldberg's in my house right now. You know, it was it was a really surreal moment when you walk through that door and you're like, I got to change my clothes. I got to. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, and yeah, now I'm like. It come from something fa oh we had come from the super bowl party <laughs> yeah with my friends at bio accelerator and so i had to kind of get out of my my dress dress clothes and just be dressed for you you know what though i i knew of the momentum that you had built i i knew of your following that continues to grow and i and i felt the same way you know big mo hooked us up and I was able to come and do it. I was as excited walking through that door as you were. And I, and I mean that sincerely because you gave me a platform to kind of go back to the good old days. And, and I, I was, I was, I was just beyond excited for three, four days prior to that. And as you know, I came in with all my homework and, yeah. but I was like, Hey, I'm doing a UFC again tonight. And that was very appreciative uh, to me as well. And so it, it's both ways. And, and I'm glad that you realize that as much as I've been blessed to achieve, I also think about friendships more than anything. And once we got in a couple of minutes, had a little couple slices of pizza, <laughs> just a couple of dudes and, and one dude's wife sitting there like, critiquing us. And the other dude's wife taking the microphone away from me. So it's all good. <laughs> Dude, I love I love the fact that you brought your wife. That was great. She is she is phenomenal, man. She is she is I yeah. mean, she's something else, man. And and uh, the fact that you brought her along for the ride, it was really cool. The dynamic you guys have together is, is great. It's uh she's made me a better man. And uh and my my ex and I have two wonderful children. We had many, many great years ago years together. Um, my son's working with me now at BYB Extreme, which I'm absolutely thrilled about. My daughter 
turns 26 in a couple of weeks. And wow. she just did a national commercial for Old Spice with uh, one of the guys from Crazy Rich Asians. I'll, I think of I'll think of the name Alex, which at Wang or Wong or and I don't want to say that because my, <laughs> my my ex is half Japanese, so it's I'm not making jokes here. But one of the really popular ones, and it was just like, oh my gosh, my daughter's in an Old Spice commercial. This is kind of cool. So, <laughs> but Fernanda awesome. has really, she's helped me to understand how I sound when I sound like an asshole because she doesn't react. And then it just reverberates through the house. And I go, oh man. And I often think to myself, Chris, I'm like, you know what? I should call Kim, you know, my ex. I should call Kim and apologize. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll apologize next time I see it. But, <laughs> but that, that's really what it's come down to. Uh, when, when somebody does not engage with you or against you, you all of a sudden find out it's not that much fun. And it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be very positive to just yell and scream and not have anything come back. And so it didn't take me long to understand that we were going to have that type of relationship where we support each other. And, and I really am blessed because I can say she's my best friend. And uh, she's here in all forms and fashion. Helped me set up the camera today, like always. And uh, <laughs> she's getting her working right now. And then we're going to go back and play a couple more games of pool. That's awesome. And, and and so it's weird how, like, as you get older, right, you, you're still learning, right? Isn't it amazing? Oh. Like, I feel like I, I thought I knew everything when I was in my 20s and my 30s. And now I'm in my 40s. And, and it, it it seems like you're always learning, right? And do you feel that way? Or do you feel like you've you've plateaued? No, so I... I I, they, hey, when you, when you stop moving forward, you start moving backwards. Um, so you always have to move forward. You always have to evolve uh, personally, professionally, uh, as a father, whatever it might be, whatever avenue it is. Uh, if you're not trying to be a better person or a better broadcaster, whatever it is, every day, then you start to go down the hill because mm -hmm. you have to at least be given it a shot to stay up at that plateau in which you worked or you or I or anybody have worked so diligently to achieve. And so, yeah, I do. I learn every single day. And I, I study a little differently than I did before. I put some stress on certain things that I didn't before or vice versa. Uh, but my work ethic is the one thing that that never changes. It, and, and I remember Bill Clement, my hero in broadcasting, saying, you know, you can be broadcasted two people to 100, 2,000, 20,000, 2 million. It doesn't matter. They're all seeing you one at a time. When you look at that camera, you got to think about one person on the other side listening. Mm -hmm. and you have to deliver to that one person how many times with the UFC it was, you know, millions of times. But you have to treat it as one person each. And, and that's the thing that I've really taken to heart. And uh, that's why when people would make their UFC debut, I would be locked and loaded on information. Because you know how hard those fighters worked to get to that level? Man, it would be the ultimate, no pun intended, but it'd be the ultimate level of disrespect to say, well, I don't know much about this guy or I don't know much about this woman because I didn't really study and, you know, they're just making their debut. That That's not right. That's not right. Too many years of sacrifice being made by those type of people to make that first walk. And I'm going to make sure I represent them properly. Now, if you just jump it in, guys and gals, we're here with Mike Goldberg. Brawl at the Bayou is going down September 16th this Saturday, and he will be on the mic telling you exactly what's going on, so make sure you tune into that. Um, and before we get into that, I do want to just discuss a couple of things here. Uh, I, first of all, like now here you are with BYB. They got a great promotion. Is there anything that, like now looking back when in your UFC career, like would you change anything going back from what you know now? Yeah, I uh, obviously I would I would I would change a lot of things, um, but not so much on the air. I just I would have, I would have approached things uh, a little less frenzied, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I would have understood that ninety eight percent perfection in the pre production world was okay. Instead, I was I was very demanding on myself. And, and, it, and it beat me down a lot. And then I would get frustrated when others didn't seem to have the same love and passion and caring and drive in which I had. And, and I, I remember my mom used to always say, like, everybody's, not, they're not you. They're not you. And you've got to understand that different people are pushed and pulled in different ways of leadership and management. And, and if that were the one thing that I would say, Chris, honestly, that I would like to have a better grasp on, 
it would be that it would mm. be not to get frustrated by others to, yeah. to just let others be others and like when i was coaching they always say when i was coaching hockey that if you're a player when the coach stops yelling at you when he stops talking to you that's when you have a problem and i should have just taken that approach if, if this person wasn't going to react if they weren't going to carry their weight quote unquote it wasn't my job to make the call and it wasn't really a good use of my energy or time or emotions to get frustrated by it and mm -hmm. and i did and and i let myself get frustrated by it i didn't walk around and yell at people i didn't act like an asshole but there was some in, internal disruption if you will because I'm like, why, why can't they just get this? Why, can, why can't they just care as much as you care about your show or as much as I care? How, how do you go through like that? If you don't want to be an Olympian, why are you even on the qualifying team? If you don't want to be the best in the world, why are you even grab a mic? And that's the way I was raised. And, and I just have to, I could have done a better job in, in just letting people be who they were and seeing all the good parts of it instead of focusing on at times how maybe they weren't like me maybe their their preparation wasn't as regimented as mine was and understand that people get to the to the peak of the mountain in different ways and some people you might think they're not working really hard at it but then all of a sudden you look up and they're already there so that would that would be it it wouldn't be a broadcast thing it wouldn't be a relationship thing it just would have been an overall perspective of understanding people a little bit better and and that just comes with age and experience I noticed that Dana White said something recently about like when he used to watch boxing, how sometimes it would criticize the fighters on the walkout. Was that like a big pet peeve? Like he made sure that you guys said nothing but positive things about these guys and gals walking out? Very much so. And um, it, it got a little tough with Joe Daddy Stevenson, who hmm. I absolutely love because I want to say he lost five or six straight. And so every time he came out, it was season three ultimate fighter winner. Um, but to Dana's point, First and foremost, there's there's a way to be, I don't even want to say critical, but there's a way to to say something that could be negative in a non-combative way. And so you can make your point of, oh my God, this guy's horrible. He sucks. Or you could say he's had some rough times in his last few fights. He's worked hard in the gym. And this is what he's going to try to do tonight to get back to his winning way. And the one thing Dana talked about, which is a great point, back then we were 90% pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. So you paid your 69 bucks, whatever it is, and now Chris is walking into the octagon and I'm talking about how you can't do this, how you can't do this, you can't do this, and you can't do that. Or Joe's doing that. And Dana's right, as a promoter, he's going, okay, you guys are, are giving everybody at home every reason not to care about this fight or this fighter and wonder why they just got money out of their wallet and took it away from the college fund to watch the pay-per-view tonight. So let's find the good in people and, and let's, when we do have criticisms, let's be constructive and respectful about it and, and go from there. You, you can't lie about people. You can't lie about performances, but you don't need to bash somebody coming in. And I'll tell you what, I don't think there's anybody better out there right now than Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. Uh, they truly have taken the mantle from Summerall and Madden many, many years. You know, the transition at Fox was obvious. But Monday night, they were having a very, very difficult time being kind to Zach Wilson. I mean, the whole world was shocked when Rodgers went down on the fourth play. The whole world was shocked. And, and even Joe Buck, I read some stuff afterwards, Chris, and he talked about it. And it was really, if, if it were Tony Romo, he would have tore he would have toured like Zach over and over and over again, which nobody really wants to hear. Even mm -hmm. if it's true, you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear somebody get overpraised either, because when Romo does a game when Mahomes is playing, I I, I mean he might as well just come in and you know be ordained as our new lord, you know, because Tony talks about it too much. But to get back to the point, Troy and Joe did a great job of talking about the storyline that was Zach Wilson in a way in which they were honest. There was definitely criticism for his performance early on, but as he started to do good things, they were very quick to point those out as well. And I thought they did an excellent job, but they they did. They had to stop themselves a couple of times. And I noticed it as a broadcaster and I give them huge props for that. Huge I, props. I, I gotta be honest with you. I hated when Aikman and Joe Buck called giant games 
because they just shit on the Giants. Like, yeah. I was just like, you guys clearly don't want the Giants to win. It's very obvious, especially Troy Aikman. I mean, he's a cowboy. but Of course. I was, well, I would, say, I would say the same thing about Romo and my Bengals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would think Joe Burrow wasn't even in that game, you mm-hmm. know, in the AFC Championship last year. It's you clear by it. Mahomes on one leg and this and that. Which, hey, I, Patrick won. They won the Super Bowl. He, he, he was the better quarterback that day. But the fact of the matter is there's two really great quarterbacks on the field. But I agree with you. There, there are certain people who lean to certain players or teams, um, and, it, and it's tough not to. And, and there were a lot of fighters I was very close to yeah. and had relationships with, had trained with, that I had to watch myself in that regard that I didn't over-praise them. And in so doing, didn't give credit to any part of the preparation or anything that their opponent was doing or even not doing. I, I was, you know, you got to put those friendships aside. Uh, but, yeah, there's certain times with your Giants, like you said, there's certain times that you don't want that broadcast team on. And, man, I put Boomer in the booth when the, when the Bengals are playing because mm-hmm. Romo has something. I don't know if he's jealous of Joe Burrow, um, <laughs> but but Tony Tony's yet to truly give Joe the credit he deserves. And we'll see what happens, you know, this year. And that's, you know, it's a different year, different time. But you have your favorites. And yeah. uh, it's pretty obvious Tony is – favorite is Patrick Mahomes. It's, it's interesting that this subject comes up because I actually want to get your, I want to dive into this a little bit more because a guy like Daniel Cormier, who was one of my favorite fighters, like I loved watching him compete and um, he is criticized of bias and even Joe Rogan now, like they're kind of saying like they're shitting on him a lot. I mean, the internet is, is ruthless, but like how do you stay unbiased? I mean, like you said, you do form relationships with these athletes. Right. How? What's the trick? Well, it to be quite honest, in my role, it's it's a lot easier to do because at the end of the day, I'm not the one who's going to form that final opinion. I'm mm. the one who's going to tell you what you're seeing. And then, it, you know, for 19 years, it was Joe sitting next to me. And, and Joe will tell you if it's good, bad, or indifferent, or if mm. he likes this, or if he didn't like that, or if that was a terrible move and he can't put himself in that position. For me, it, it really my role is to get the ball to the superstar and then the superstar is going to make a great catch, not make it, what, whatever it is. But it's it's not my role to criticize or to talk about fight strategy, yes, but only to do so to set up my broadcast partner. And so it was a little bit simpler for me because it wasn't my role. But, hey, you got to have an opinion. Yeah. And if polarizing or not, you got to take a stand and you got to have an opinion And let's go back to the first thing we talked about. If you're considered the best and the worst in one of the polls, that means everybody's listening and everybody's watching. And and, and that's the way it's going to be. And if you're in the role of DC, if you're in the role of Joe for so many years, if you're in the role of Big John, if you're in the role of Randy Couture and Kenny Florian, Dan, whoever it might be, you're going to say certain things that certain people, right, wrong, or indifferent, are going to be offended by. Mm -hmm. And that's just something that's going to happen because – a lot of people have blinders on for the fighters that they love as well when they're sitting at home watching them. And so anything you say bad about them is going to be, oh, DC's an idiot or Joe doesn't Joe doesn't bring it like he used to, which yeah. is, you know, opinions are like assholes, right? Yeah. I mean, we've said it before. And, you know, I like the analogy, too, where people have said, you know, some people like ketchup, some people like mustard. And somebody asked me, well, what are you? And I said, well, depends on what night it is. Know, because some nights people think I mustard, the other ketchup, but it's very subjective. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that part of it is is the key. And, and for me, all that matters, Chris, is that they're doing their homework. And if they're doing their homework and they're talking to the fighters and then they're able to form their opinions, you, you take it for what it is. And if you don't want to watch DC or you don't think Joe's where he was before, hey, that's fine. Go on Twitter with your three followers and the little <laughs> skull head. And your fake account and call him every name in the book. It's not going to ruin his night. It's not going to ruin DC's because nobody is out with a headphone on that's trying just to tear people down. Because if that were the case, none of us would be on the air very much. I got a question about, so are you, you're, you're working with BYB right now, but are you open? Could you work with other organizations too? Or are you exclusive? Uh, no, I do uh, ProBox, ProBox TV still. Um, and we're every other Wednesday, we do live fights. I'm with uh, Pauli Malignaggi, Chris Algieri's joined the team. And I absolutely love working with Chris. And I mean, Chris has a kickboxing background, Long Island guy, Matt Sarah, Ray Longo, 
And so I got Long Island and Brooklyn in the broadcast booth <laughs> next to me. I, I'm like, I don't have to say a whole lot. I just got to throw it up and let them go with it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm loving all the boxing that I've done the last couple of years. The bare knuckle continues to build and build. And 2024 is going to be an amazing year for BYB. And because we have that patented Trigon, you can have all these other organizations and great fights and great fighters. But much like the UFC, click, you know, you saw the Octagon, you knew it was the UFC. You see yeah. the Trigon, you know that it's BYB. And I work with Paulie Malinaji on that as well. And to me, there's not a better striking broadcaster as far as boxing or take the gloves off. It's still boxing than Paulie Malinaji. He's the best. He's mm-hmm. the best. And I just sit back and I learn from him. So, yeah, I'm doing that. I'm doing the uh, pro box. I do the BYB. And, hey, if something happens with Bellator getting sold, because when I was no longer with Bellator, it's because they made the move to Showtime and Moro was full time at Showtime. And so that was there's nothing I could have done, nothing I did wrong. I was just texting with Coker a couple of weeks ago. He's like, you better be at UFC 300. I already got the VIP seats for you. And when the Bengals come to play San Francisco, you're coming to be my guest. So I still have a great relationship with Scott. And, you know, who knows? I mean, the, the guy I look up to the most in, in the sport of MMA is Big John. He's a big brother to me. And if I get a chance to go back and, and do some shows with Big John McCarthy, bring it on. I'm ready to go yesterday. So it's funny you say that. I was actually, I was going to lead into this. So I, and, and someone in the chat says it's not the same without Goldie and the UFC. I'm sure you hear that all the time. And I agree as well. Um, UFC 300, April of next year, is going down. And we're talking about, oh, maybe Brock Lesnar comes back, Ronda Rousey returns, Fedor, maybe th- drag Fedor in. What the hell, right? They're talking about all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, wait, wait, hold on, pump the brakes. What about Mike Goldberg? Why not get Mike Goldberg on the mic for UFC 300? Any rumblings about this? Not, not yet, but I, I would be there yesterday. I, I would be absolutely honored by it. Um, I I know what Joe and I put together. I know that we pretty much taught the universe a a renegade sport and and brought it into houses all over the world. And and now it's as mainstream as mainstream can be. It's everything that Lorenzo envisioned that it could be when they purchased it a couple of decades ago. So I I love that the fans would think of that. I, I love that it could be an honor to do it again. And I would... I would love to join the friends that I still have there at the UFC and, and reunite like Peaches and Herb. So, yeah, I mean, if, I, if they call, I'm answering and, and I'm there. Uh, but that's on them. That, that's, that's their decision to make. And uh, if, if something like that doesn't happen and for the fans who would like it to happen, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. But if something like that doesn't happen, Chris, I'll be sitting with you and Jess or I'll be the first one right next to the couch watching it as the fan that I was for the 19 years that I had the best seat in the house sitting next to Joe. So that you can't take away. You can't well, take away my passion for combat sports. I, I have already started talking to some of my YouTube friends behind the scenes over here, and I think we should make a viral movement. I think the fans should get together and say, we want Mike fucking Goldberg at UFC 300. And I it starts today. We start the movement I'm today. I'm going to clip the shit out of this. We want Mike on the mic the voice of the <laughs> octagon there for UFC 300. Mike, if they called you tomorrow and says, Mike, we want you there, what's your answer? Uh, fuck yeah. Yeah, that's my answer. What time you need me? You need me now? But, well, it's not for another seven months. I don't care. I'll start my prep now. Can I get some bios? Who's fighting? What are we going to do? Where are we going to do? Where's the production meeting? I'm in. I'm in. I would be absolutely honored. It, it's always a very special place in my heart. And to be like sit next to Joe again, like, come on. Like, how great would that be? How great would that be? And, and if you, here's the one thing that is talked about a lot. And, and now I have to do exactly what you and I were talking about before, Chris. I, I, I need to say something in a very positive way that some might think of as not as positive as it's meant to be. The fans have still, many years later, been extremely supportive as they are in the chats tonight. The fans would love to see something like that. And if you're about pleasing your fans, then maybe you might consider it. Not me, not me, maybe it's Connor fight, whatever it is, but let's just let's just say that. I'll leave it at that though. But if you're about what do the fans want? What do the fans want to see? What do they want to hear? What do they want from the production? And the fans want X, Y, or Z, 
maybe you bring in Z for 300. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I think I made my point. Chat, if you want Mike Goldberg <laughs> on the mic for 300, I want you to spam the chat right now with 300. Put 300 in the chat um, right now if you want Mike Goldberg on the mic. I'm already looking at them, and they are fired up. Not one negative I, comment. Everyone is saying they want Mike Goldberg on the mic. And I got to be honest with you, I, I think this is what we really need. Who gives a shit who's in the cage? They're going to put something interesting in there, but do something special on the commentary. I, I mean, I think that's, you know, give us some nostalgia. So UFC 300, for God's sakes. And Mike, let me just show you something right here. This is the this is the chat going crazy right now. They're losing their minds. They're losing their wow. minds in the chat. They're going nuts. The 300s are in there. They're I going crazy. It. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, so the people have spoken, baby. Here I we go. It. Here we go. Look at them go, Mike. Oh. They're going wild. I love it. Even, even that guy who goes by the M word, you know, being a Buckeye, I, I love you too. <laughs> so I'm going all out into love for that school up north. <laughs> <laughs> there Thank we go. You it's... Each and every one of them. Because at the end of the day, that's what I've always said, and we talked about it before, Chris. That's what I do it for. I do it for the fighters and the fans. Yeah, you have a boss, you have the, but. I do it for the fighters and the fans. And and there's not, I I can't think of a fighter who I still don't have a great relationship with because they knew that I always represented them with class, that I always did my homework, that I always talked to them, that I always read the bios, that if they were changing something up in camp, I credited that person in camp. Whatever it might be, I represented the fighters and I entertained the fans. And so bring on 300, I'm ready to go. Ready they're they're still spamming it. They 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 want this, and we're gonna we're gonna do whatever we can. I mean, I don't know what kind of pull we can do, but I want to make this freaking happen. And and I I, I mean, think- I do have Silva Diaz behind me. I've got my shot with Fedor. I got my shot with Ronda. I mean, and the Bare Knuckle uh, Hall of Fame. I was honored to be inducted into the Bare Knuckle Boxing Hall of Fame this summer. So uh, thank you to Scott Bird and everybody at the Bare Knuckle Hall of Fame. Quite an honor to go on. I went in with Pauly and Claudia Trejos, um, and you know, they're, they're salt of the earth people, great boxing legends as commentators and a two-time world champion and a magic man. And so it's an absolute honor to, to have that poster behind me. too. I don't know. That is awesome, man. Dude, it, it is crazy, man. You're at the, I mean, I was thinking about it. Like, you know, it's wild. I, the, the Bellator situation. Did you hear what Dana White said? I, I'm, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. They, <laughs> I'm trying to get you on the, the uh, commentary team, but not in trouble. Uh, but I do want to get your opinions on Dana was talking about like Bellator. The media asked him what they thought about Bellator being bought, right? They're, they're selling and, and Dana's like, who the hell would want to buy them? <laughs> well, who, who would want to buy Strike Force two decades ago? Mm-hmm. which was built and run by the same individual named Scott Coker. Yeah. So here's, here's the situation that Dana looks at it as a rival promotion. And I, and I guess it is, but the fact of the matter is, is the more organizations out there that are generating fan interest and fan excitement, the better off it is for the entire sport. Even if you are the industry leader, even if you are the Q-tip, not the cotton swab, even if you are Kleenex and not tissue paper, and that's what the UFC is. And I and I was blessed to be in that role for a lot of years. The fact of the matter is, is there's great fighters on the Bellator roster, as great as it's ever been. Scott Coker's done a wonderful job in building a great roster. The PFL continues to expand and look to build their own roster. And so if you look at it from the fighters who are involved, then if I'm a fight fan, I might be saying, but wait, what about so-and-so or so-and-so in the octagon? And I'll give you the perfect example of, okay, why would anybody want Bellator? Okay, well, then why would anybody want the most popular fighter in Bellator history, Michael Chandler? Well, they got him, and all he has done is entertain, excite, be a class act, get on the ultimate fighter with Connor, put on shows, win or lose. And so to a certain degree, if you're saying who wants Bellator, who wants PFL, if I'm a fighter in that organization, I'm thinking, well, you took Michael Chandler and that worked out really well for him. So from a fighter perspective, I I think a little bit more of an open mind would be, uh, would be appreciated. And let's go right back to it. Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier is a Scott Coker guy. Yeah. He was a star in Strikeforce. 
and he came over to the UFC because Strike Force was purchased by Zufa and all those fighters. They purchased it for about a dozen contracts. Dan Henderson, Rampage, Luke Rockhold, um, Fedor never really happened, but he wasn't really a Strike Force guy at the time. Um, but there were there were certain fighters who were under contract who grew into the sport with Scott, who we knew in the MMA world needed to compete in the octagon against the best the UFC had to offer, and Strike Force was acquired. And so if you look back at the past, it, it wasn't the worst decision ever to be made. Yeah, I love Strike Force. Strike Force was amazing, and and when I started getting into it, Strike Force was like one of my favorites to watch. Yep. And then UFC just stole me. But <clears throat> I look at Bellator, and it, it just for me as a fan, it just never turned out to be like Strike Force. Like Strike Force was something special, and Bellator is good, but it, it seems like it's getting I don't know. I, it's it's not the same. At least when you were on the the call over there, we had the nostalgia. I was like, okay, this yeah. is cool. But uh, you know, no offense to the people over there now, but I mean, it's just not the same. I don't feel. Well, and I I think I understand where you're coming from in that many people admired the grassroots grown into these big strong trees that Scott Coker took from San Jose from his backyard, you know, in the Bay Area and built a promotion like Strike Force, and then all of a sudden sold it for a ton of money and became part of the UFC, of the Zufa machine. And that is because Scott took it from the very beginning. Now, mm -hmm. was it kind of a mess when Scott came in and replaced Born Rebney? Yeah, yeah, it was kind of a mess. And Scott has built a roster that's unbelievable, but the presence of the UFC is, is much more overwhelming and much more massive than it was when strike force was coming up. And so people kind of have been put into this situation. Well, people will say this, Chris, Oh, he fights UFC. No, he does not fight UFC. He is a mixed martial artist who fights in the ultimate fighting championship. Mm -hmm. And because of the UFC, and again, I was blessed by it because of being the first, because of being the biggest, because of being, the industry leader, people think, ah, you don't fight in the UFC, you're no good. Well, oh. that's far from the truth. That's far from the truth. And there are a lot of great champions in other organizations that could give some champions in the UFC a run for their money. And then, you know, people want to put down a guy like Ryan Bader. Like Ryan Bader's only gotten better. Yeah. And when Ryan Bader left the UFC, the Odo, Rumble, John, um, Glover and and what a, one other loss that was it. So you tell me how you know Ryan Bader was was let's say trash because that's not what I believe in Ryan Bader and he's one of our guys here as you know. But don't tell me that well, well Ryan Bader couldn't make it in the UFC so he went to Bellator. No, that that's not the case. Ryan Bader's gotten better and better and better. And you put Vadim Nemkov in at 205 against somebody in the octagon, Bader's guy. Ah, you got yourself a handful right there. And again, I go back to Michael Chandler. And Michael Chandler is, is, is perfect proof of the fact that regardless of the organization in which you're fighting in, you can be a star on the biggest platform. Yeah. The, the Monday night game ended with a, you know, a guy from a small college, undrafted, running back to punt. And I know you watch Hard Knocks because you're a sports fan like I am. Joe Douglas, the GM of the Jets, what he did to those two guys when he was telling them they were making the team was just like fish hooking. I'm like, oh, coach, I thought you were I thought you were cutting me. And then to have him run the punt back, sorry, Buffalo Bills fans, but to run the punt back because of what you saw in Hard Knocks and the journey in which he took, that is a perfect example of why you got to watch every fighter individually and take them for their skills individually and then decide what organization is that mixed martial artist worthy of competing. It because like, just because you're in the UFC doesn't make you the best in the world. It yeah. just makes you one of them that has impressed people at the UFC. And it does put you in the upper echelon, but it doesn't mean you're the you're the be all end all. And talk to me about Sean Strickland. The guy just uh, oh. upset Israel Adesanya 
And it's just crazy when you look at, you know, him from what he was back in the day. He had this long hair. He was a good-looking fella that just kind of was quiet. And now he's all brash on the mic and steals the belt from arguably one of the greatest middleweights of all time. And you hear about his upbringing where he's, he was abused by his father. And, and just to see his emotional, like, wrap around the waist – with the belt and Dana White pissed off that he won the championship and oh, oh whoops I, I was supposed to say that. <laughs> have you ever had have you ever had a moment? Uh, now I'm getting all over the place, but have you ever had a moment where you seen Dana White and you're like, oh, he doesn't want this person to be champion? Well, I I I lived at the moment where he didn't put the belt on Anderson's waist in Abu Dhabi because it was such a horrible fight because Damian Maya didn't want to engage mm-hmm. and all of that all of that excitement of having Anderson there and of having a Gracie on the card because the sheikhs and everybody in Abu Dhabi and in the UAE said, we need a Gracie on the card. And so Henzo fought Matt Hugh. And then you had Anderson Silva and Damian Maya and they, Hey, they, they love their grappling over there, but that was not a good fight. It was not a good yeah. fight. We all know that. And I lived it. I would watch Dana walk away. I was, I was steps away from him during that press conference. So, yeah, I've I've seen times in which that emotion has been there. I'm I, I'm sure that many were not thrilled when Holly Holm beat Ronda Rousey in Melbourne, Australia, because Ronda was such a rock star. And not only, and Joe said, what what's that have to do with it? And I say to this day, my point when I said that is that Ronda had made this meteoric rise. She was doing every commercial possible, doing every movie. Every television, everything she could to maximize her fame and to build her fortune, she didn't say no to anybody. Mm -hmm. Then that fight gets moved up three months because Robbie Lawler gets hurt. And Joe commented on she didn't look the same and and she looked a little puffy and her build wasn't the same and her attitude. And that's when I said it takes a lot of energy to be a rock star. And what I meant is that she had been so busy and gotten away from exactly what should have been on the table that it was the perfect opportunity for Holly to do what she did. Same thing happened to Amanda Nunes. I knew going into that fight, I didn't think Juliana Pena would would beat her with strikes, but I also knew that Juliana Pena was not going to win the rematch because mm-hmm. Amanda was going to be prepared. And so, yeah, there's there's definitely certain fighters, especially the ones that that push the numbers, that you don't want to see knocked off. Yeah, because they push numbers, and at the end of the day, it is a different business because of pay per view. And you do want the stars that people want to watch to be the ones that have the belts and have the accolades. And Strickland's story is amazing. Mm-hmm. It's what combat sports is about. And, and I find it even more so, Chris, in boxing. I mean, eight out of 10 boxers were saved, were saved because they got into boxing or somebody took them under. Mike Tyson, perfect example. Where, and I, how many boxers have I spoken to said I'd be dead or in jail if I didn't find boxing many, many years ago. And so combat sports is that outlet that has done great things for guys like Sean Strickland. And I can tell you watching Dustin Poirier and everything that he's achieved over the last few years and these mega matchups with Connor and others, I remember Dustin Poirier when he was one of Tim Crater's guys from Louisiana. He was he was Lafayette, Louisiana. Oh, there's somebody else other than Daniel Cormier from Lafayette, Louisiana. I remember that with Dustin as well. And so over to Shira was always great, but for him to go on that ride and become a champion at such an elderly age, if you will. So, man, that's why I say, and I said earlier, that the first time Sean Strickland walked into that octagon, he should have had a guy on the mic, and then he probably did, that gave him every single prop that he deserved from all the hard work that he put into just to become a mixed martial artist who could at the highest level, who plays on Sundays in the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and look where he is today. Do, do you recall some of his older fights from back? It's kind of crazy. He was like the king of the apex for a while, um, but he's been around. I'm mean, what 2014, 2013. I mean, yeah, low key. Like, what can you remember from back in the day from Sean? That he was he was low key, and and Sean Strickland's fighting. Mm-hmm. Should we be excited? Um, I don't know. Like he. He's good nights. He's he's not as good nights. He's still developing this part of his game. Yeah, I, I see the young but hungry lion who needed to evolve, who needed to train with the proper people, who needed to have the setbacks that occurred in, early on in a career of a champion. Because 
Hey, you, and and Randy Couture always talked about it. You learn a lot more after a loss than you do after a win. And it's, you know, it's not what happens to the man. It's what the man does when it happens to him. And I remember Dana, that, that kind of goes back to the, you know, talking about losses as guys would come in. But it, let, let's say it's, it's John Jones and, and Randy or whoever, whoever it might have been back then. It's, it's the two best. Mm-hmm. And Leoto Machida and John Jones and Leoto, you know, coming off a loss to John Jones. OK, well, th- that's a storyline. Yeah. What is he going to do differently? What did he go back and see on that film to change to have success as he makes the walk now? But you have to be careful how you phrase that because you don't want to talk about a guy who's had multiple setbacks. Mm-hmm. But Sean is a guy, and Sean O'Malley the same way, and he's a crazy dude. But the fact of the matter is you put in the time, fight in the apex, you fight in the minors, if you will, and if you want it bad enough, and the night is yours when the time is right, and the night was his against Adesanya, you take that belt and the emotions start to pour out. And to me, that's the best. When, when, when the favorites win, it's really cool if you're a fan of the favorites. Yeah. But everybody wants to root for the underdog. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants the storyline. Everybody wants the backstory on how this guy was saved from the streets. And remember Court McGee? Yeah. Court McGee won the Ultimate Fighter. Mm-hmm. Was dead. I mean, flatlined. Heroin addict. I mean, should have been dead. And somehow he made it through it. He battled his addiction. He overcame it. And I don't care. Every time he stepped in the octagon after that, Chris, it was a victory. And not only for him. But for how many people out there who thought there was no other way, that the only path was the path that they were going down and it was a path that was going to end in a a hundred mile an hour collision into a brick wall. And Court McGee is another great example of combat sports literally, literally saved his life. And so if you can't get excited about stories like that, then personally, I don't even care sports or not. You're not a human being. Yeah. You've got to root for people who've gone through the mud and gone through the tough times to come out and have success. I mean, even if you want to talk about Usyk now, I mean, just the fact of everything that's gone on in the Ukraine in the past year plus and, and how, how they grew up and how now we know more of the things that they did not have in Eastern Europe as they grew up, but yet somehow they were able to make it to the top. And if you can't give respect to those kind of people, like I said, just, just watch a bunch of sitcoms or reruns of the Simpsons and you'll be happy because you're not really a human being. Have you ever had a moment where you were like so emotional, like to the point where you felt like you were going to cry or something like that? Have you ever had that moment? Yeah. When they called and said they weren't renewing my contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Besides that. <laughs> when the Bengals, when the Bengals lost in the Super Bowl in the AFC oh, championship. Oh my God. Dude, um, you must've been a wreck with that, that Super Bowl. I could only imagine. Oh my God. I know. I mean, you might as well put Joe Montana in again so he could just make it a hat. <laughs> yeah, but, I, yes, I have had those moments. And I'm trying to think of one where it, it really hit me. And I just, I, I am blanking right now. But like a Matt Serra moment with his, his win over GSP. Um, was, was amazing. Here's one. Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping, Luke Rockhold. Oh, yeah. Michael Bisping, short notice. Michael had been with my buddy JP, Jason Perillo, for a long, long time. Anybody up to that point didn't think about the greatest British fighter to ever grace the octagon, didn't think about the, the first fighter from the UK to win the ultimate fighter competition. They thought about the guy who was on the wrong side of the H-bomb and that Hendo blasted and like pretty much took his head off. And, and that was unfortunate because Michael's a great fighter. But when Michael came in and won that night, Yes, that was one of the greatest moments that I had the honor to be part of. To watch him come in on short notice, it was, I believe, his 24th. You, there's guys that get title fights, Chris, in fights six, seven, eight, five, yeah. nine, 24, I want to say. And Michael had not had a title fight and wouldn't even have had that one if the previous opponent didn't suffer an injury. Mm-hmm. And it was the night after Muhammad Ali had passed. So you had Kevin Casey in there, Muhammad's son-in-law, and we're doing a great tribute on the greatest of all time. And then you have an upset like that. And uh, it's almost like, for me being a hockey guy, it's almost like, do you believe in miracles? Well, yeah. 
And uh, so that was one of them where I, I definitely was. I was I was pretty much in tears. And when Jason Perillo just went, <laughs> it was the greatest. <laughs> that guy is something else, huh, Perillo? And Jens Pulver. There were, and with Jens, too. I had a very emotional tie with Jens and many others. But when Jens won some of those tough battles early on and, and earned the belt, there were moments there, too, that really, really hit me in the heart and in the soul because Jens is finally in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Like, great yeah. fighter, better human being. Yeah, he seems like a great guy. He does. I think, wasn't when you came over, I think, wasn't that when they announced him or something like that in the Hall yeah. of Fame? Yeah. yeah. it's pretty wild. Yeah, Jens. Yeah, Pol- and, and it was, it, it was, and I remember texting him that night, and here's one for you. Um, Kim, my ex, she went to the Hall of Fame ceremony when Jens was inducted. It was kind of funny. She's like, oh, my God, it's just your voice. You you sound great. You know, and I'm like, ah, oh, thanks, Kim. <laughs> but Jens brought up the story about Little Eagle rises again. Well, his nickname's Little Eagle. I get that. Way back when, we didn't have bios. We didn't have researchers. And Jens kind of just was, yeah, Little Eagle. Like, okay, Little Eagle. Look, I... He doesn't have all the research background that I researched so diligently now. And so Little Eagle rises to the top. And he talked about that in his Hall of Fame speech. And so you want to talk about a Hall of Fame? You want to talk about my UFC 300? Moments like that, that is what it's all about. Is for Jens to go back to that moment and that be so memorable to him and our relationship still be that great two decades later, it's awesome. That That's really what it's all about. Who, who Do you still keep contact with a lot of the guys, whether it's fighters or people behind the scenes? or? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always in contact with the people that I go back with. And if I see them, it's like I, I just saw them yesterday. So with Jens getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, I was on with him immediately. If it's a Robbie Lawler and, and everything that he achieved. I, I watched that whole Militich fighting system. I, I watched him owned the UFC for five, six, seven, eight years. And so Rampage, I, I stay in touch with Rampage. Um, supposed to do a podcast this week with Patrick Cote and David Loazzo. Um, I hope it's not in French because I will be <laughs> worthless if it is. Um, I just know Voulez-vous coucher, you know, that one um, from, from, <laughs> from the song. But yeah, I mean, the Predator will always be a friend. He'll always be a brother to me. And Patrick and I had a great relationship over the years. And and that's one where you talk about emotions and, and you talk about sadness when he blew out his knee. I mean, mm-hmm. it was it was a different situation, but you wanted to see him get his shot. He had worked so hard to get a shot at the top, and then he blows out his knee in the fight. And so I'm in tears for a different reason, because I had seen my guy do the Sean Strickland, come through the regionals and work through everything and and be in the shadows of, of GSP, but yet be part of that iron sharpens iron in Montreal that made all those fighters so great. And so, yeah, I keep in touch with many people all the time. And I see a lot of crossover in, in BYB, not so much in boxing, but in BYB, I see a lot of crossover. Ike, Ike Villanueva is, is fighting for us uh, coming up. Uh, he's in the co-main event. Um, Satarchik is, is, you know, an old guy who was in, UFC, I believe, as well. Um, Matt Kovacs. You, you know, you see these guys who had maybe not a lot of success inside the octagon, but they were in the UFC. Mm-hmm. And you, you go, well, hey, I, I remember that. And then here's here's a moment that that also just, that, that almost does bring you tears and tears of joy and the laughs is we have a champion, Mark Irwin, from Huntington Beach. Well, his trainer is the creepy one, Ian McCall. Uncle Creepy. Oh, yeah. I wonder, Ian I always comes wonder in what... with the mustache, the whole bit, right? And Mark has this Carter persona, and he's just now with the leopard hair, and he wins the title, and then he wins his fight. And then we sit in the hotel lobby afterwards, Chris, and we're just telling stories. And Mark is literally like a little kid in the candy shop. Eyes are this wide. Because Uncle Creepy and I are going back into the WEC encyclopedia. And I called those fights, or I was That's at cool. those fights as a fan before we took all the lower weight classes and included them within the UFC flag. And and Ian was like surprised that I had still so much love and respect for him. And I'm like, bro, why would why would you be surprised? You were champion, and not only that, you were a great person. You were never a dick in an interview. You always came and gave it your all. 
Why would I, why would I take any exception to that? And even Charles McCarthy, Chainsaw. Chainsaw mm -hmm. has a fighter who, who fought in the Trigon. And he says to my boss, the owner of BYB, he goes, you know, you got the best in the business. You know, he's a freaking legend. And I'm like, Charles, here's, you know, PayPal, Venmo, what do you need, brother? What do you need? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, my boss is very kind. He said, I know, I know. And we're very glad to have him. So Dada, Dada 5000. He's awesome. Uh, you know, yeah. He is awesome. And, and that guy is like a little kid around me. And he really, he's like, and he's telling people, you don't understand Mike Goldberg, we are Mike Goldberg, Paulie Malinaji. That legitimizes what we're taking, taking from the backyard because it is from his backyard and what we're looking to achieve and evolve into. Just look at the broadcasters we have. I watch that guy. And uh, so those relationships are always going to be very, very special. We had an interview with Dada 5000 a little while back, and um, he's such a nice guy, but he reminds me of Mr. T, right? Oh, and, God, yeah. And, 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 we, and he was telling the story. He was very emotional into it, and Jesse got up and started laughing, right? She left the room. So now I'm trying to hold it together, and I'm talking to him, and then Jesse comes back, and she's dying laugh, and, and Dada was just rolling with the punches. It was so unprofessional by us, but he's such a funny guy, and I don't know if he's doing it on purpose, or is it a shtick, or is it really, like, is he just genuinely funny? Like, I... How does it work? I, just, I, it's just his personality. He's he's genuinely funny. Yeah, and, he's a funny dude. But he's a, but he's a guy who gets it, and he's a mm -hmm. guy who loves it. And yeah, the, I mean that fight between him and Kimbo for Bellator still has some of the best numbers <laughs> of any fight in Bellator history. And yeah, Dada Dada almost lost his life that night. Um, and our owner Mike Vasquez was friends. Our owner of BYB was with Dada. That whole time because they were already buds from being down in the southern part of florida and tyler connell bruce connell may he rest in peace brucey if anybody watched me on the ufc they know tonight's show produced by bruce connell directed by anthony pasquale giordano they know about brucey well tyler his son tyler was in the truck for that mm -hmm. fight so tyler was at a recent byb uh just watching having some fun you know he's he's a brother to me with family forever with the connells and he meets Dada, and I'm like, Dada, Tyler was in the production truck when you fought Kimbo. Wow. And and that's Dada. We we went to the NHL All-Star game, and Dada was like, Goldie, you got to teach me this. I don't know what's going on, but it's really cool. <laughs> but I, why do they keep blowing the whistle with the puck in the blue line and all that? I'm like, hey, you could teach me a lot about fighting, but sit down, young man, my personal bodyguard, and I am going to give you the ABCs of the greatest game on earth, uh, the, the game of hockey. And so he, he really is – a gentleman and the first time i went down to a byb as a guest and then ended up being brought on to the organization afterwards the look in his eyes was his gen like what are you doing here wow. like in a good way like what he didn't know that the owner had invited me down to meet everybody then he's still kind of in awe that i'm doing the broadcasting and so that's where people need to meet the person before yeah. they look at the big picture and go well red hair this that da 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 yeah, I mean, the, and you want to talk about a guy who grew up in the tough world? You're talking about Dada. I bet, yeah. Dada grew up in a very tough world, similar to Sean Strickland. And the old fights, you know, that he used to rep the backyard brawls and the dog fight, and they're going to do a dog fight too, documentary on Netflix. That all started with him. And so we knew as an organization with BYB that we needed to evolve past that mentality much like we had to in the John McCain human cockfighting days, but that we always had to remember that that's where things were settled back in the day. You went in, you had the three ropes, you went in a triangle, you fought, you did your thing, and then you shake hands like any martial artist will do. And now we're doing it on a bigger and bigger level, and uh, exciting times are, are to come. But but it's Dada's, Dada's backyard, which is the, the brainstorm and is the designer, if you will, of the Trigon, the smallest surface in combat sports. And so uh, you'll never hear me have anything bad to say about Dada because he's never going to give me a reason to say anything bad about him. And, and here's the event. It's Brawl on the Bayou. It's this Saturday, September yes. 16th. Tune in. And I got to say this. I am going to be a super supporter of BYB because me and BKFC has, have split ways. So they can go <laughs> fuck themselves. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got to be honest with you. They're very unprofessional. And I had a conversation with Sam Alvey about it. 
and um, he they treated him like crap. And I'm like, what's going? I used to be really cool with them, and then all of a sudden they just became super unprofessional. Any little bit that I've dealt with BYB, they've been nothing but sweethearts. They've been super professional, and they put on a great product with you on the mic. So BY Team BYB all day. Well, I I greatly appreciate that, but and that goes right to the top though. That goes right to Mike Vasquez and our ownership and the way that he would literally give you the shirt off his back. And um, Mike is just a, a wonderful human being who made a lot of successful moves and endeavors in his professional life, but is passionate about the NASCAR team he used to run and now BYB being different. And we have fighters who have fought in the other organization who have said exactly what you said. They don't treat us like that over there. Why do you guys treat us so well? We don't want to fight over them. We want mm -hmm. to fight for you. And and that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. Fighters just want to be appreciated. They, they want to know that the car is going to pick them up on time. And it can be a 72 van with eight other fighters in it, but they don't want to stand in front of the airport and wait for the ride. And they want the weigh-ins to be professional. And they want the backstage. And they want the doctors. To, they want everything to be in place. But they want to be treated like human beings win, lose, or draw. And especially in Bare Knuckle, you're leaving it all there. And so I'm glad to have you aboard. Uh, you guys, you just have a great audience. And the more that you can help us push things, the better it is for us in our main event. I mean, Patty Juarez. So Patty Juarez's older sister is Barbie Juarez. And she is literally considered the Julio Cesar Chavez female version in Mexico. So hmm. that's Patty. Patty's the champion. She's taking on Monica Medina, who's from Biloxi. Patty Juarez's younger sister, Lourdes, had a title, just lost her title. So she's the world champion in boxing. Barbie is the equivalent of Julio Cesar Chavez, and she's everything in female boxing in Mexico. And now you got middle sister Patty coming in and boxing in the Trigon and putting on great shows. And, oh, by the way, Monica Medina, how about this? She is the one of the only, maybe the only female to have been in all three of Jorge Masvidal's Game Bread MMA Bare Knuckle MMA show. Oh, all three. So Monica is a badass, and the first fight was crazy. The rematch was supposed to be in Tampa about six, seven months ago. Uh, Patty blew her knee out, but Monica's going to get a chance to get it back and run it again in her backyard, and she's all about training. And, and that, to me is what it's all about. And I mean, I, I look at different names on, on the list that people who had success, uh, Kiali Kanakoa, uh, who's from our area now. And, oh, no kidding. you know, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I, I have a question, Sarah actually. Just uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but the the belt that you have that that's I can't remember what the belt's called, but there's a special belt that was oh, the police gazette. Yeah, police that was in BKFC. And now it's with you guys. So how did you guys get a hold of that thing? Well, it, it goes both places. Um, okay. Scott Burt is is the, the man who has developed the relationship with the police gazette over many, many decades. Scott Burt's the man who runs the Bare Knuckle Boxing Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. and, and Scott shows love to, to all the organizations. But again, you see how things are run. You see how you're dealing with different people. And you're going to gravitate to niceness and huh. to the people who treat you the way that you know, your mom taught us, you know, with kindness and compassion and equals. You know, it's the old saying, you treat the CEO the same as you treat the janitor. That's that's life. And that that should be that should be the mantra of everybody on this earth. And so Scott is Scott is very proud to be at events that that have police because that belts on the line. And in our main event with Patty and Monica, they will be fighting not only for the BYB lightweight title, but also the women's BYB Police Gazette Diamond Belt. So that Police Gazette, beautiful. So I always say they're fighting in the main event tonight for diamonds and gold. It's a pretty cool belt. For those of you that don't know, yeah, BKFC was had it before, and, and I was like, where, what happened to it? And then I saw you guys had it, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, the Police Gazette Belt, that's pretty neat over there. Yeah. And go check out BYB. about that, the relationship with law enforcement and the relationship that mixed martial artists have had with the military. For years, I mean, it's just it, it makes sense. It makes sense. And I remember, I don't know if I told this story before. You know, Big John McCarthy's father was legend, legendary chief of police in Los Angeles. But John was on the police force for nearly 25 years, and he went undercover at a certain point in his career. 
And I used to say on the air all the time when he was reffing, like undercover police officer for the Los Angeles police force, da, 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 undercover, undercover. And we're just having a beer one night. I go, I go, I go, big brother. I go, big John, you still undercover? He goes, no. I go, what? Wow, what happened? He goes, some jackass about once a month tells millions of people that I'm an undercover police officer. <laughs> like, shit, I'm that jackass. He goes, yes, you are. And then, the rest is his. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, 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 tell me how we could see this this fight going down uh, on uh, Saturday night. I, I know it used to be on YouTube. Is it still on YouTube or? Yep, it, it's still on YouTube. It'll be on a bit of a delay. It's on B N Sports, and the best way to get B N Sports is through Fubo, and okay. that's the easiest place to find it. Is on B N Sports. We're doing Friday kind of UFC Unleashed shows there. Now our as the product evolves, it will be available on different platforms in that, and that will be another way to watch it as well. We were doing them on YouTube for our fans for a while. Be in wanted to be in, mm -hmm. and so we do an exclusive for them first. So if you want it live, just lock it in and be in sports. Okay. Um, they're kind of like ESPN. There's 14 of them. Uh, you'll find a lot of their stations have a lot of great darts <laughs> and cricket, but we're on be in sports. And uh, dial it in. Look at it through Fubo and and find us because the fights are incredible. J.D. Burns, the berserker, um, he had an experience with Robert Fallis that was unimaginable. And, and, you know, we lost him way too young. And the, the thing that – and Bell Valenzuela is in the Hall of Fame as well. Look, look at my boy Ryan Jett. Um, I mean, these guys are warriors. Eric Olsen is a trip. He is a trip. Will Chope has fought in every form of combat possible. Uh, Laurent T. Nelson, who's on the card coming up, he fought uh, what's called Letway, which is basically Muay Thai with headbutts. So it's the oh, art boy. nine limbs. There you see Mike Vasquez with Big Mo, Mike in the blue suit. Um, is Mo going to be uh, the, uh, yep. the ring guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, All yeah. right. Oh, Mo's like on a – rocketing he's he's killing he's it as man. big as he is tall now and, uh, <laughs> and, and i love him because he's he wants to get better every show wants to get better all the time and he was probably the first guy to comment when you said you were having me on tonight because that's, oh, uh, that's my guy guy and i dude. love to see the passion that he has and i know he loves to see that many many years his elder but still in the same platform that i have the same passion that i've always had as well but the, the storylines are there uh, J.D. Burns just leaves it all. He went to a seminar with Robert Fallis for jiu-jitsu many, many years ago. And Robert said, just smile. Just smile. It, 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 make, it makes people uncomfortable when you fight and smile. And so he's getting punched in the face. He just keeps smiling. And it throws people off. He's got purple hair. Um, he's a Taekwondo guy. He's won as many as he's lost. But he's like, my blood or your blood, there's going to be blood and there's going to be entertainment. He's fighting a kid named I Isaiah Quinones. Born in Boston, Puerto Rican descent, went to military school, tough upbringing, abuse, all of the things that could be the similar storylines to Sean Strickland, homeless in South Florida for a while, hmm. found an avenue to fight for Mike Vasquez. And now when he's not fighting, he works for Mike. He, my son's first experience at BYB, he's literally helping to build a trigon. My kid doesn't know a, a wrench from a French. I like <laughs> No, and, and Isaiah's like, no, Goldie, I'll put him to work. And when I got a text from Cole, because I had a pro box the night before, he said, Dad, People's Champ said that he's got me. He said, that's all I got to say. I'm like, Isaiah, you got my son. Awesome. <laughs> but Isaiah fights J.D. Burns. So you got two guys that really define the sport that are getting things started. And then you have the sister of two boxing world champions. One, the female Julio Cesar Chavez and Barbie Juarez in the main event. So against the local star in, in Monica Medina. So it doesn't get much better than that. Here we go. Yeah, they got their little trailer on Instagram here. So go check out BYB's Instagram. Go follow Goldie on TV. I mean, Goldie's killing it over here. He's going to be live on Saturday. So this is a that free. That's those two right there. That's the first fight. That's oh. Patty. Yep, and that's Monica. The mighty Trigon. This is exciting mighty here. Mighty Trigon. We could hear all the surfers in combat sport. <laughs> I love it, man. And we're gonna hear the "Here We Go," and just like that, we're gonna be hearing that. Oh uh, hell yeah! And you know that is the one thing that I can say about bare knuckle in the BYB world 
Is I if we have eight fights, there's a good chance I'm going to get at least six. It's all over <laughs> in the night. Where before you weren't sure, but fights that go the distance are great too. They're wars in MMA, or but it is all over just like that. I get to say that a lot in BYB, and that, that's kind of cool. And I could say until we see you next time, right back here inside the Trigon. <laughs> uh, you know, I can I can play a little bit with the things that I had so much fun with with the UFC for two decades. That is awesome. And how about this? We're, we're going to Denver in December. Oh, so get out of here. Your anniversary of the UFC, obviously. First show was at Nichols Arena, November 12th, 1993. And we're bringing the Trigon to Denver uh, into Moe's backyard. I was going to say, right? He's yeah. over there. Oh, so, yep. So we'll, uh, that's going to be a big, a big show for us. And we're excited about it. That is awesome. I got to catch up with Big Mo too, man. He's such a cool dude, man. Such really? a, before he gets too big time, you know? I, I, I'm telling you, I, <laughs> I hope he talks to me when I see him. Oh. <laughs> well, listen, Goldie. Actually, I, I'll leave you with this. He said, Dad, yeah, I met Claudia. Um, I met um, Don, who's our social media guy. I met Isaiah, and I met the really tall dude. And I go, <laughs> you mean Big Mo? He goes, yeah, the, the really tall dude. I'm like, and I told Mo that, and he was he was cracking up. <laughs> oh, he was super nice, but I I did really catch his name. I I just, but he was really really nice, and I just know the the really tall dude. Like, all right, that works, son. That works. Well, now he knows it's Big Mo. Now he knows it's Mo. Big Mo is. I mean, he's gonna be a household name very soon. I mean, the way he's, I I can't get over the events that he's doing. It's nuts, man. And, it's so and crazy. Boxer has done just a great job, and they understand what he brings to the live event, and. People who understand that energy and enthusiasm, what it's all about, and getting the crowd into it and getting an environment that makes the fighters better and the fans at home enjoy it even that much more, they're going to do it for a long time. Is, is he going to be doing the ring interviews too? Or Oh, no, yeah. He's been That's doing crazy. that. And I don't, it, we just started doing it because it was like Polly trying to get in and out and doing every interview afterwards and, and that. It's just, it's like, hey, let Mo talk to him. And yeah. So as far as I know, he'll still be doing them. Um, There's the not many people doing tough that. On him is, no, not at all. Yeah. The only thing tough on him is if he's got 5'4 Patty Juarez or 5'5 five, five Monica Medina <laughs> and he's interviewing the champion. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when I interviewed Bill Cartwright back in the days. And by the time the spit got down, it was an absolute drenching. Uh, like Niagara Falls. So Could get that you know, wide shot. Mo's you know? just got to do this way. Yeah, you got to get that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man well listen mike listen i i have a i have a gazillion more questions but you got to play pool right is is pool code name for wild sex or what, what are we doing uh, <laughs> depending on who wins depends on who it's gotcha yes yes I yes gotcha. it, it can it can lead it can lead to that but we really do play a ton of pool and uh Great friends over at what is what is now the billiard factory, but Diamondback Billiards. Um, and I, I went to talk to my buddy Dan, who works over there, and he's a diehard Bills fan. He was at the game Monday night with one of his best friends, who's a diehard Jets fan, who couldn't wait to see Aaron Rodgers and thinking they had a chance. And Oof. he was telling me the story today. But yeah, we've uh, we've gotten into it. We just got our new Olhaus and Monarch tape table, and it's just like it's, it's, I'll send you a picture. Yeah, man. Three. That's but, awesome. I yeah, if, if, in years. if I'm down, if I'm down after three games, I try very diligently to tell Fernanda that it's a five game series. <laughs> if I'm up after three, we might go into that other phase you talked about more immediately. <laughs> if I'm down after five, it's seven. If I'm down after seven, we're playing nine. But she's smart enough to walk away. You should play strip <laughs> pool. That's what you should do, right? I mean, I, every you know that may that may have a. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have fun doing that. Thanks. And we're going to do hashtag Goldie 300. That's what I'm going to say. Hashtag Goldie 300. Keep an eye out because we're going to be trying to blast that all over the uh, the interwebs, okay? Hey, and uh, I can't thank you enough. And, and you are truly one of the good guys in this world. And the approach that you and Jess take to this crazy business is one that I admire. And anytime, anytime you want to shoot the shit, and that's basically what we've done. I'm in, brother. So God bless you. Congratulations on the newest edition. Try to get some sleep. Be nice to your wife. <laughs> and realize one day they will not take all of your sleep away. They'll just take all of your money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. I can't wait for that. Well, Mike, thanks again, man. I appreciate the kind words. You're the fucking best, man. I love you, man. Okay? Love you too, brother. All right. Have a great night. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for Mike Goldberg live on the MMA Holes. Let's go, baby. It is all over.
<laughs> All right, we'll talk soon, Mike. There he is. Goldie, 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 man. One of the best in the business. Mike Goldberg live with the MMA Holes. Let me know what you think in the chat. And I got to say, one of my favorite people to talk to, man. I, like, I'm telling you, I have more questions. But he's got to play pool, man. He's got to play a little bit of pool. Uh, and uh, shit, man. If you missed our first interview with Goldie, we really dove into, you know, the backstory and, and all that stuff. And, and what I try to do tonight is just navigate around the things that we missed last time and have a nice conversation with Mike. And he's such a cool dude, man. Such a cool dude. But Goldie300 will be the hashtag. We got a clip some stuff from this show, put it out there. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to make a movement here. We're going to get Goldie on the broadcast team for UFC 300. Who the hell cares who's in the cage? We want Mike Goldberg back, for God's sakes. We got to hear the, you know, the it's all over just like that. Come on, man. Let me know in the chat what you think of Goldie uh, returning on the MMA holes. Really fun talking to him. And uh, it was nice of him to, you know, last minute we, we reached out and he was nice enough to come on. And and check out BYB Saturday night. We know we got the UFC going down with uh, Shevchenko uh, and Grasso, but uh, I'm going to have my eyes peeled on BYB to see what's going on over there as well. So make sure you support them. BYB is a great company. Uh, let's see. We need Goldie emoji. We might have to put that in the chat, man. I tell you what, if we can get Goldie 300, if we get him on that broadcast team, guaranteed lock, he is getting his own emoji in our live chat. There's no doubt about that. But we got we got We got to get moving here. We got to get him on the broadcast. So we got to retweet when we clip. And and if you guys can clip shit from the show of Goldie, you know, uh, for the broadcast team for 300, clip, throw it on your YouTube channel, throw it on your social media. Let's get this movement going. Hashtag Goldie 300 and at the MMA holes. And, of course, uh, tag Goldie as well so he knows you guys are shouting him out. But let, let's get this going, man. Let's roll. We were, I was thinking about this today. I was on my way to get a little haircut. And I'm like, all right, we're going to have Mike Goldberg on again. This is cool. Can't wait to, to catch up. And I'm like, I need, a, I need something here. We gotta do something here. And then I realized UFC 300 is right around the corner. I'm like, how is he? How is he not on the commentary team for that? So, yeah, Fedor versus Brock. Here we go, dude. Come on, I'm getting chills just thinking about that shit. So, if you guys want that, let's 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 get this ball rolling. All right, guys and gals, I'm gonna end it right there. I want to. I appreciate you guys stopping by. I did see uh, Casey Jones gifted a membership, a double champ membership. Very kind of you, Casey Jones. I know with interviews, you know, we're just kind of doing our thing over here. So I appreciate uh, that kind gesture by Casey. I don't know who got that membership. I don't even know. But whoever got it. Oh, Lieutenant Dang's legs. All right, there you go. You're a member, baby. You're a member. And we got another notification coming in over here from... Ah, uh, Super Chat. A Furious Storm. Daimos. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. What are you thanking me for? You gave me the $2. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dude, I loved it, man. I love talking to Goldie. He's the best. And uh, I want to get your comments down below, you know, on the interview. Timestamp your favorite spots. And remember, hashtag Goldie300. It takes a lot of energy to be a rock star. That's right. You need emoji for Ann? <laughs> we do need an emoji for Ann. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much, man. Uh, I can't do my emojis. What? Johnny Smith can't do his emojis? Are you on an iPhone or something? Zane is a cuck. I agree. I need an OG emoji for me, the knitter. Maybe, maybe, and maybe. A uh, UFC 300 GSP versus the Spider Silva. Oh, boy. I, don't know. I mean, hey, you never know. You never know. Thank you, CJ the Poet. All right, guys and gals. Remember, in the comments se section, let me know what you think. And uh, don't be an a-hole B. And M-M-A-hole. Good night. That one, Gurnan.